Well, today we're going to wrap up our series, Get Plugged In. We've been talking about, over the past several weeks, what it means to serve God by serving others. And I want you to understand, you cannot serve God fully without serving others. And I'll kind of explain that today when I talk about serve like Jesus. Now, there are many reasons to serve, chief among them is that God told us to, all right? That's, I, I don't know that we need any more reason than that, but there are many benefits to serving. Uh, you develop friendships. Uh, you grow spiritually. Think about this. You grow spiritually when you serve. And think about how important that is. Because let's be honest, if you're going to serve God by serving others, it means that you're going to sometimes have a little conflict. Sometimes there's going to be a little friction in your life, right? Because, you know, we love to say we embrace the mess because life is messy. We love to say this is the perfect place for imperfect people. But the problem when you have a place like this, okay, the problem when you serve, you serve imperfect people. And sometimes imperfect people will make you mad. Sometimes they may say something that just kind of gets under your skin. Sometimes... God forbid, they might disagree with you, you know? And so here's the point. When we serve God by serving others, what happens is God uses those moments in our life to help us grow spiritually. Not only do we feel fulfilled using our gift and our ability, but also we are uh, investing our lives in others and we are getting better. Think about this. You cannot say that you have the peace of God unless you're in the middle of a storm. Anybody can have peace when everything's peaceful, right? I mean, that's, that's pretty easy. Um, but do you have peace in the middle of a storm? Are you able to grow and love God and love others and make an impact for the kingdom of God when somebody's getting on your nerves? When somebody is doing something that aggravates you or that you disagree with, the point is you grow spiritually when you begin to serve God. You get to use your gift. And man, I could talk about this uh, a lot. But the fact is when we use the gift that God has given us, we are the most fulfilled in life when we do that. I, I, I was just observing this morning uh, as the music team, the praise and worship team were practicing. And I was marveling at how much they were just like, hey, this is in this key and you got to do this. And, you gotta, and I didn't understand most of what they said. But I just watched them because these guys have the ability to do music, to play music, to sing. And man, it was just, they were right in their wheelhouse. They were loving life. They were, you could tell they loved doing this. Now, did they have to work on it? Yeah, they had to work on it, but they have this gift from God. And whenever we're using our gift for God, particularly in the context of the church, it is very fulfilling in our life. And, and I could just talk about everything. Musicians do that. Artists, if you are going to paint or draw or do sculpture or create whatever art, you know how fulfilling that is, how that makes you feel. Um, the same for people that are builders, for example. Um, you know, it's hard work, yes, but they take that gift that God gives them, and when they have finished building something, they feel really good about it. Why? Because they're using that gift. The same with being a teacher. The same with uh, being able to program a computer. It doesn't matter what it is. You are most fulfilled... You are happiest when you're using your gift for God. Now, a gift that I'm particularly fond of that people use is the gift to be able to cook. Some of you are, like, really good at that, all right? And I make a good partner because I'm really good at eating, all right? And so when you get those two things together, somebody's going to gain some weight is all I'm saying, all right? But the truth is God uses us when we... Obey what he says. It's almost like God knew what he was doing when he told us to do these things, isn't it? Okay? And so today, 
you make a difference when you serve like Jesus. Now, I could tell you all kinds of stories uh, from the past. One of my favorite stories, you've heard me tell this before, we had a man that um, visited our church. It's been a number of years ago. And he was actually, he was about to commit suicide. And he said, you know what? I'm going to give it one more chance today. And he said, if I don't find what I'm looking for today, I'm going to end my life. So he came to our church. It's just kind of a random thing. He kind of opened up his computer and looked, and he, uh, our church was called Avalon Church at the time. He started with the A's. He said, well, I'll try that one. And he walked in, and there was a member of our guest services team, a woman that welcomed him and just made him feel special. And he was like, oh, well, maybe there is some hope. Anyway, he came into the service, and he listened to the message. He listened to the worship. And that day he got saved. He gave his life to Jesus Christ. And he went home and he said, you know what? I'm not going to commit suicide. I, and he, the guy ended up getting baptized. He moved away. He was only in this area for two or three more weeks after this. But my point is this. There is no little service. When it comes to God, when it comes to the church, you say, well, all I can do is like mow grass or help clean up. There is no little job. Uh, it doesn't matter if you're the pastor, you preach, you sing, you run sound. You, it doesn't matter what you do. Maybe uh, whatever gift you have, whatever time you have, whatever you do, whatever you invest, God will use it just like he used that. And, and the, the, probably one of the greatest things I can think of is the fact that, you know, just a few weeks ago, we had three, uh, I'm sorry, two teenagers get saved and baptized, and a nine-year-old girl get saved and baptized, and it is a team. It is everyone together. Some give, some serve, hopefully you do both, but you are being a part of serving like Jesus. So let me, uh, just today, I want to read to you some words of Jesus, and We'll learn from this how, as we wrap this up, why you should serve. If you're not, I hope you'll get plugged in. If you're, if you're not doing anything, start doing something now. You say, well, I don't really have that much talent. Give it to the Lord. Little as much when God is in it. You give something to the Lord, he uses it greatly. So let's look in Mark chapter 10. And we we'll begin reading in verse number 42. Here's what he said. So then Jesus called them together, his disciples. And he said, you know that the rulers in this world lorded over their people. That phrase, that word means to dominate. And he's not talking about like dominating like you're the Atlanta Hawks. They don't dominate. All right. So maybe that's a bad example. Uh, but he's not talking about dominating like in a football game or a baseball game. But he's talking about this idea of it all being about you. It's all what I want. It's all what I say. It's all what will serve me. And that is a worldly way of, of looking at things. They want to lord it over others. And their officials flaunt their authority. That word means tyranny. Tyranny. And man, how many times have we been tyrannical? In our attitude toward others. You know, you don't have to teach people that. Uh, a little child can be a little tyrant. You ever notice that? You ever notice that one child can have a stack of toys this big, and the other child can have only one toy? And what does the child that, want, that has the big stack of toys want? They want the one toy the other kid has. By nature, we are tyrannical. Okay? So he says... This is the way the rulers of this world are. They, they lord it over them. They flaunt their authority over those that are under them. But among you, it will be different to believers. He said, you can't do that. It needs to be different in your life. Whoever wants to be a leader among you must be your servant. Well, that turns it on its ear. That seems different. He says... And whoever wants to be first among you must be the slave of everyone else. Man, we all have a desire to be first. I mean, 
you know, if, if nothing else, you want to be first to the lunch line after church, right? I mean, we want to be first. We want to arrive first. We want to be first. We want to be in first place. We, we like to dominate, okay? And, and once again, he's not talking about business or sports, but he's talking about this idea that everything in life is about you. It's about you. So he said, but if you want to be first, you got to serve others. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve others and to give his life as a ransom for many. If you're a note taker, I want you to write down three things. Uh, if you don't take notes, you can follow along on the Bible app. You can follow along on our church app, uh, the church center app. And you can have the notes. You can look at them all during this week. But how do you serve like Jesus? That's what we're wrapping up with today. How can you do what Jesus said to do in this text? Well, the first thing is this. you got to work on your attitude. He's talking about the attitude of the heart. He said, if you want to be first, you got to be willing to be last. Does that not require work on your attitude? I mean, the fact is, our attitude will determine our altitude. Our attitude is very important in how we live, how we serve, what we accomplish in life, what we do for the Lord. Our attitude is extremely, extremely important, okay? But you got to work on it because it doesn't come naturally. I mean, the natural thing is to want to be first. The natural thing is to want to be served. The natural thing is to want to be the boss. The natural thing is for everybody to do what you say with no questions asked, okay? But we got to work on our attitude. You have to, this is a spiritual exercise, okay? Not only, you know, and a lot of times people think about when it comes to spiritual things and following the Lord, they, they think that it's some kind of ethereal, kind of angelic kind of approach to things. No, Christianity is extremely practical. You know what God says? You got to be willing to serve. You got to be willing to put yourself in last place. You got to be willing to work on your attitude. And God knows we have to work on our attitude, all of us, right? I mean, sometimes just going to get something to eat at lunch, I get a bad attitude. Now, don't act like I'm the only one, okay? I've seen some of you, I've seen how some of you drive, okay? In fact, years ago, um, I had a person, I was driving to church, and someone was on my tail, and they were blowing the horn at me, and they came around me, and they shot me a bird. I'm not making that up, okay? They came around me, and as I pulled into the church parking lot, I saw them parking their car, and, uh, you know, sometimes you got to work on your attitude, all right? Sometimes you got to work on the attitude. But what we need to understand is that in the world, they see leadership as a place for privilege and pride and power and position. That's what most people are after. They're after the privilege. They're after the position. They're after the power. And Jesus said, no, if you want to make a difference, if you want to follow me, if you want to do what I tell you to do, then you've got to be um, having the attitude that uh, leadership is going to be different. You see, now, this is the interesting thing. Jesus does not deny the authority of leadership. You have to have leadership. You can't have a business without a leader. You can't run a government without a leader. You can't run a family without a leader. You've got to have leadership. Leadership is important. You can't have a sports team without a leader. Leadership is necessary. So Jesus was not suggesting that there be no leaders. He was not dealing with the, uh, the truth of leadership, but he was dealing with the attitude of leadership. And so what we've got to learn to do is to have the right attitude. Uh, here's what Daniel chapter 4, verses 29 and 30 say. This, I think, is a beautiful picture, of, even though the story's not beautiful. It illustrates for us clearly what Jesus was talking about. This is about King Nebuchadnezzar. You remember who Nebuchadnezzar was? He was the king of the Babylonian Empire. Now listen to what it said about him. And at the end of 12 months, he, Nebuchadnezzar, was walking on the roof of the royal palace of Babylon, and the king answered and said, now listen to what he said, 
Is not this great Babylon, which I have built by my mighty power as a royal residence and for the glory of my own majesty? Wow, pride much? I mean, the fact is, he thought that life was about me and through me and for me. I mean, that's what he said. He said, this came through my strength. And can I let you know, there's nothing that you can do in your own strength alone. Now, does God give us strength? Does he tell us to work hard? Yes. Are there some people that take advantage of working hard and they, therefore they get better? Yes. That's not what he's talking about. But think about this. You have, Nebuchadnezzar had no more choice in where he was born, to whom he was born, than anyone else. He didn't choose that. God is the one that gives us our talent, our mental ability. I mean, so the fact that you think you can take credit for everything in life that's about you, look at what I have done, that is denying the power and the work of God in your life, and that is sin, according to what God did to Nebuchadnezzar. Um, by the way, what did God do? Well, he had warned him. He said, you need to repent. You need to turn to me, but Nebuchadnezzar, no, it's about me, it's for me, it's through me, it's all about what I want to do, and guess what happened to him? Uh, the Bible tells us that he lost his mind for a period of time. He literally, it says, ate grass like a cow. Now think about that. I mean, the fact is, God humbled him, and I think he did later turn back to the Lord, and he repented, and he humbled himself, but you and I need to understand that leadership and life is not just through me, about me, and for me, but the Bible says that our attitude must be characterized by service and servanthood and selflessness. Now, that's easier said than done. It's easy to be selfish, isn't it? I mean, that is the natural default position. It's all about me. Selfish. It's me, 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 me. Let's talk some more about me, right? I mean, but Jesus said, you got to adjust the attitude. You got to understand that there's more to life than just what you want. Mark 10, 31, it says, but many who are last, or first will be last, and the, uh, the last will be first, and the first will be last. Now, what was this paradox about? Well, I believe that part of it's about eternity, there are a lot of people that think that they're good. They think that they're first. They're moral. They think that, well, you know, God surely is not going to hold me accountable for my sin because I'm a good person. And I think that in one way that is what that's about. The first will be last. Those that think they're first, those that put their works above uh, the work of Jesus Christ, those that put their importance above everything else, they're going to be last. But it's also a spiritual application in this way that there are many who they maybe seek the spotlight. Maybe they seek the accolades. Maybe they seek uh, having their names, name and lights, and they're going to be surprised. When we stand before God, they're going to be surprised at the people that seemingly were last. They weren't celebrated. They didn't have their name and lights. But when they get before God, you're going to find out, oh, those people made a tremendous contribution to the work of God. Man, I've seen this happen so many times in my life. People that, uh, you know, you just didn't notice them much. A woman that in the church that I grew up in, her name was Alma. Alma served our church. Most people didn't even know her name. She came to that church every week and cleaned. She cleaned the bathroom. She cleaned the auditorium. She vacuumed the floors. She dusted and mopped. She did all this stuff. And for years, as long as I can remember, I saw this woman not seek the spotlight, not be having her name in lights, but she was faithful and she served. You know what I believe? I really do believe this. When we stand before God... That one is probably going to get a greater reward than many television evangelists that everybody knows, and everybody says, oh, that is such a good preacher, that's just such a good speaker, or that's just such a good singer, 
but we're going to be surprised when we stand before God about the importance that God places on little things given to Him. So the first will be last, and the last will be first. And so we must understand that uh, this shows that we've got to live for eternity. In other words, we don't just live for this world, we live for another world. Now, let, let me say this. Um, you and I need to be careful when we think about serving God, and you hear preachers talk about this, we tend to think that spirituality and serving God is somehow or another this weird thing, and you got to sit around and you got to hum or you got to listen to worship music all the day, all the day. Uh, you got to uh, sit around and listen to podcasts of preachers all the time. That's not what being spiritual means, okay? Uh, God created you to be fully human. Don't you understand this? It was God's idea, not yours. God made you uh, with natural, godly desires. God made you. I know this sounds funny, but the desire for certain foods, not the desire to overeat, I don't mean that, but like the beauty in life that we get. You ever just see a, a gorgeous sunset? Maybe you see the beach or the mountains, or, or maybe you look at a beautiful painting, a work of art, and you're like, wow, that is amazing. How in the world could they do something that beautiful? And then you look at some modern art and you think, a five-year-old with a crayon did that, right? So, but the fact is, we desire beauty, okay? That's because we're created in the image of God. That's because God has designed us to be fully human. What is it that's so wonderful about a delicious, well-prepared, well-presented meal at the end of a long day of work? What is that about? Well, because God has created you to be fully human. What is the desire to have a... Um, a, a marriage, a child, a relationship, a job. That's a part of being human, okay? So do not think that being spiritual means that you got to spend seven days a week at the church or 18 hours a day listen to Christian music or uh, that you serve God by being a monk or a nun or, you know, someone that walls themselves off from society. That's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible talks about, and, and though it doesn't actually say this, this is the concept, we're to be in the world, but not of the world. Okay, does that make sense? You're to be in it. In other words, we're to fully engage. We're not to engage in sin. We're not to engage in, in the worldly philosophies. And by the way, worldliness in the Bible is not about the length of your hair or whether or not you go to movies, okay? Uh, some of you are like, I don't even know what you're talking about. Those of you that grew up in a really strict uh, uh, background like I did, you know exactly. We couldn't listen to rock music because that was worldly, all right? That was the devil's music, all right? So, uh, in fact, we even had times that we would burn records. Yes, we had records back then, all right? We would burn tapes and all the, we didn't have CDs yet when we still did this, so we didn't burn CDs. But the point is, that's not worldliness. That's not what it means to be worldly. To be worldly is to have the philosophy of the world. To be worldly is to think like the world, by definition, is apart from God, the enemies of God, uh, those that are, I'll, I'll put it this way. I read a book one time, this pastor talked about that many church members, and here's the term he used, are Christian atheists. He's like, oh, that doesn't make sense. How can a Christian be an atheist? And here's how he defined it. He said they're Christian, they believe in God, they just live like he doesn't exist. And how many times do we live a worldly life? It's the worldly philosophy. It's that all there is to this life is my job and my money and my retirement and all this. This is what life is about. And, uh, you know, I'm to earn some money. I'm to have a few parties. I'm to have a good time. And that's it. Well, that is a completely worldly philosophy. So what does it mean to live in a way with the right attitude 
that is not a worldly way of living. Well, uh, it's you've got to act like there's another world. You've got to act like that there's more to life than just this life. You've got to believe that what God wants us to do, yes, is to live a fully human life, but to live it in light of eternity, okay? So the understanding that we have is that what God wants us to do is he wants us to live with the attitude that there's more to this life than just this life. We got to live with the attitude that it's more important to make a life than it is to make a living. Think about this. When you and I live this life, and let's say you live to be 100. There are more and more people living to be 100. How many have a family member or someone you know that lived to be 100 years of age? Raise your hand. A few of you, okay. All right. Um, well, people ask me, do I live, want to live to be 100? Absolutely not. All right, I do not want to live that long. I mean, I, if I could still get around and, and if the highlight of my life was not going to Golden Corral, all right, then yeah, maybe. But the point is this, okay? You can live, you can live to be as old as dirt. And that is a drop in the bucket compared to eternity. I mean, think about this. If you knew that the vast majority of your life, and I'm talking about eternal life, including the resurrected body, the resurrection, uh, you're going to die, yes, in this body physically, yes, you're going to die. One day, you're going to draw your last breath. But if you're a believer, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, not only will your soul go to heaven, your spirit go to heaven, but Jesus will one day resurrect your body, and in eternity, you'll have a body, a glorified body, a wonderful body, a body that doesn't have pain or sorrow or regret, that can eat and not get heartburn, that can eat whatever you want, right? I mean, think about how glorious that is going to be. I want you to get this, okay? If all there is to life is this life, then yeah, make it all about you. If all there is to this life is just this life, then by all means, please do not serve. Please do not volunteer your time. Please do not give. Please do not say, I'm going to be involved and make a difference. Please do not. Because if all there is to this life is this life, you need to make it about you. You need to get all you can, can all you get, do everything you can to live in the moment, for every moment you possibly can. But if, there, if you believe, as I do and as the Word of God teaches, that there is life after this life, if you believe that we are eternal beings and we are going to live somewhere forever, and you're not going to be sitting on a cloud with a pair of angels' wings Strumming a harp, okay? Some people get this silly idea that that's what heaven is going to be like. That would not be heaven. That would be hell, all right? Uh, first of all, I don't want to sit on a cloud, okay? Second of all, I don't want to have a pair of wings. Y'all say, you don't have to worry about that. You'll have horns, all right? So I, I'm, I'm not interested in a pair of wings, and I'm definitely not interested in playing a harp for all eternity, okay? But you're going to be able to live and to serve and to do things, I believe with all my heart, Scripture teaches that I believe the greatest art in the history of the world will be in eternity. We're going to see the most beautiful art. You think we enjoy music here? Wait till you get to heaven. That I mean, is just going to be so amazing, so wonderful. Um, you think you have good, anybody ever eat at a like really fancy restaurant and you're like, oh, this food is so good. And then you look at the bill and you have a heart attack and you have to get rushed to the hospital because you didn't know it was going to cost that much. But oh, the meal was so good. Man, you just were gushing. You can still talk about that. There are meals that I've eaten that happened years ago that I still remember. Man, they were fantastic. Let me tell you, the greatest meals the greatest food, the greatest wine that you'll ever have is going to be in heaven, not here. 
but in heaven, okay? And here's the point. We must adjust our attitude because what God has called us to do is to live for eternity. Well, I've kind of talked about a lot of things. I had some more things to say. Let me give you the last two points, and we'll be done. You got to, number two, respond to God's call on your life. God has called you to serve. God has called you to make a difference. Uh, Jesus said, uh, the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve others and to give his life as a ransom for many. What does that mean? It means you got to have a do-whatever-it-takes attitude. Don't you like people like that? I mean, whatever it takes, that's what they're going to do. Barrier, it's okay. We're going to do whatever it takes. Problem, that's okay. We're going to do whatever it takes. No solution that anybody can think of, that's okay. We're going to do whatever it takes. God has called us to have a whatever it takes attitude. We're to be awake and aware of the needs around us. Uh, Luke 12, 30, uh, 37 says, Blessed are those servants whom the master finds awake when he comes. Are you awake? I mean, are you awake and aware? Of what goes on around you, what's going on in the world, what the needs are in the world. God's called us to be awake. We've got to make sure that we are um, responding to God's call on our life. And then uh, be an example. Um, 1 Peter 5, 3, not domineering over them and your, those in your charge, but being examples to the flock. Be an example to believers. Be an example to others in the church. Be an example for others to see. And then finally, uh, you got to keep an eye on eternity. You got to keep an eye on eternity. Why? Because only, like the old song says, only one life will soon be passed. And only what's done for Christ will last. And that's what God has called us to do. That is how you serve like Jesus. Heavenly Father, help us to serve you Help us to serve like Jesus. Help us to have that attitude. Help us to be aware that there's more to life than just this life. That we can please you by serving others. And God, I pray that you'd help us to do that. For it is in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, let me just uh, tell you a couple things. We're going to have our offering in just a moment. Uh, but here's what I'd like for us to do. If today you're interested in learning about church membership or what that means, or you say, I've been coming here a long time, but I've never actually become a member. Uh, we say things like participation is membership, okay? Just signing a piece of paper does not make you a member. You got to participate. You got to do something. You got to be involved. And so if you have not been through the next step class, okay, we're not going to do a whole thing today. But I would like to speak to anybody, you've not been through that next step class, uh, and by the way, that is necessary to be considered a member, all right? And so why is that? Because we explain what it means, okay? Um, it won't be long, but if you're interested in that, this room on the right, on your way out, I'm going to go and hang out in that room, and if you're interested in talking about that, you stop by. You say, well, how do I know if I'm a member or not? There's your answer, Okay. Uh, if you don't know, if you've not been through that class, you need to stop by. If you say, well, you know, I'm not really sure. Maybe I went through the class, but I'm not really sure. I like to be refreshed. You stop by. At the very least, at the very least, you can stop by and say hi to me, and uh, that'll make your day better. All right? So, but uh, we're going to do that right after the service, the room on the right. So if you're interested in that, uh, you can do that. Okay. Don't forget that we're taking up for today and two more weeks, serve your world. We're going to serve our children's village. And if you've not given yet, give something. I, I say to everybody, you can do something. You say, well, I don't have a lot of money. That's okay. You say, well, I, I can only give $5. We'll give $5. You say, well, I can only give $3. We'll give three. Uh, it doesn't matter what you can't do. It matters what you can do. And when you get involved, once again, it's going to make a difference. So I encourage you to give toward that. 
we're going to um, uh, have, I think, a tremendous, tremendous time on the 21st as we watch these kids get some of these things that you've purchased for them. And uh, the caretakers, uh, Bob was telling me that I think there is one, now, if this doesn't happen, don't hold me to this, but I think one of the caretakers has no microwave in her house, okay? And I think the plan is that we're going to buy a microwave for one of these uh, homes for these kids. And that'll be uh, transformative, right? That'll be, boy, I mean, can you imagine not having a microwave? Um, how else will we eat so unhealthy if we didn't have a microwave, all right? So we're going to put our bad health on them over there as well. So, uh, but anyway, I hope you will give toward that. So ushers come, drop your next step card in. Uh, if you have a prayer request, put that on there. If you're new, put that on there. Uh, if you want to know more about the church, put that on there as well. But let's give. There are four ways you can give, and as they're passing these, okay. Oh, by the way, if you're going to give to the children's village offering, how do you do it? You designate it to Hope, okay? If you're giving online, designate it to Hope, all right? Because uh, that way we'll know what uh, comes in there. Um, what was I saying? Okay, four ways you can give. Uh, you can give in the bucket as it passes, obviously. Uh, you can give by giving on the church app, the church center app. Most convenient way to give, it's the way Kim and I give. Um, it is the most convenient way to give. Um, you can give uh, by going to the website, stillwaters.online. You can give that way. Uh, you can give by texting the number 84321, 84321. And you can uh, give that way. Uh, obviously, you can mail it in as well. We do have people occasionally still do that. And you can mail it to the address, all right? So don't forget, I'm going to be in that room. And if you'd like to come by and say hi, uh, then do that after we are dismissed. All right? Okay. We good? Everybody good? Thank you for coming today. I love you. Have a great day. We'll see you later.